All right, I will go ahead and call to order this meeting of the Missoula Board of County Commissioners on April 4th, 2019. If people want to sit down and stop talking. No? Thank you. Um, I just called the meeting to order, so we'll go ahead and begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can you read the form for uh, for public announcements, we have a proclamation for Her Fair Housing Month that uh, Commissioner Slotnick will read. Whereas, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, commonly known as the Federal Fair Housing Act, which guarantees fair housing for all residents of the United States, was signed into law April 1968 and whereas the month of April is nationally recognized as Fair Housing Month and a time to reflect on and reaffirm our national commitment to the ideal that fair housing opportunity is available to everyone in the United States without regard to race, color, religion, national origin, sex, familial status, and disability and whereas Missoula County recognizes that all residents are free to purchase, rent, finance, and insure their homes without regard to their sex, marital status, race, creed, religion, color, age, familial status, physical or mental disability, or national origin. And whereas Missoula County welcomes this opportunity to celebrate the 51st anniversary of the adoption of the Fair Housing Act and to reaffirm our commitment to the principle of fair housing for all by strengthening efforts that address discrimination in our communities, supporting programs that will educate the public concerning their rights to equal housing opportunity and assuring every person their right to live free of, fe of the fear of housing discrimination. Now, therefore, we, the Missoula County Commissioners in the state of Montana, do hereby, hereby proclaim the month of April 2019 as Fair Housing Month in Missoula County. We encourage all citizens to recognize this celebration for the purpose of improving the quality of life for all residents. Thank you. Uh, any other public announcements? So it's been a few weeks since we last met in this room as a body, and since then, and this is kind of ex uh, extending the, uh, the theme of uh, non-discrimination that we just heard, since that last time that we met, there has been brought to our attention uh, a spate of hate mail and hate literature that's been distributed to some of our constituents here in Missoula County. And, uh, I want to assure uh, Missoula County residents that Missoula County stands absolutely opposed to uh, any discrimination of this sort. And uh, I would just encourage our citizenry to remain vigilant and, and push back against whether it's anti-Semitism or any other form of discrimination that you see. This is absolutely unacceptable in Missoula County, Montana. Other announcements? All right, is there any public comment on items that are not on today's agenda? All right, seeing none, our current claims list includes claims that are received as of March 6th to March 26th, 2019 by our office, and they total $4,659,238.52. And as always, if you go onto our meeting portal and click on that number, it will delineate for you uh, what all those claims entail that add up to that total. With that, we have three hearings today. I will begin by opening the hearing for, hearing for the Giles family transfer with a staff report. Um, do you mind if Lauren gives the presentation and then we can have you give your, or do you want to do it the other way around? No, you, you first? I'll give a okay. Deal, then we'll <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Cola. Uh, Lord Miller, Planner with Community and Planning Services. Uh, this request today is from uh, Brian Giles to utilize the family transfer exemption to create and transfer one parcel to his daughter. The property is uh, located off of Gooden Lane, north of Interstate 90. Uh, the current lot is approximately 8.29 acres, and there's an existing single-family residence and a detached garage um, on the property. 
The tract is uh, unzoned and is located within the area covered by the 1997 Butler Creek Area Plan. Uh, the plan designates this area as one dwelling unit per 40 acres, so the recommendation today would be exceeding um, the density that is recommended. The proposed parcel uh, configuration would result in two total tracks. Uh, track 2D1 would be transferred to the applicant's daughter, a total of four acres in size. The application does indicate that the um, transferred parcel would be used for residential purposes by uh, his daughter. And track 2D2 to remain in ownership by Brian himself will be a total of 4.2 acres in size. Uh, the request was sent to to county agencies for comments. Uh, most agencies um, provided a standard response of no concern for the proposal today. Uh, the rebuttable presumptions and general evasion criteria were triggered, uh, were um, reviewed in the staff analysis and those that were triggered are noted in bold in the staff report. Um, there are only two triggered by the application. Uh, the rebuttable presumption was if the proposed division is on a track that was previously created through use of a family transfer exemption, mortgage security exemption, or an occasional sale exemption. Uh, the tract was previously created through an occasional sale exemption in 1979. Uh, the second criteria that was triggered I mentioned earlier was if it was incompatible with with the growth policy. Uh, the land use designation for this parcel is open and resource, which is one dwelling unit per 40 acres. Um, so this does exceed that density that's recommended. And staff is recommending that the request by Brian Giles to utilize the family transfer to create and one, to create and transfer one parcel to his daughter, Miranda T, be approved. And I have a few questions for you, which are already up here, so thank you. <laughs> um, and if you want to turn on the microphone, a green light should come on. And if you want to state your name for the record. Brian Keith Giles. Um, and questions for you. So did you buy the property with the intent of dividing it? Uh, no. Uh, do you or your transferees intend to transfer the property within the next year? No. Nope. Uh, have you talked to anyone at the county about going through subdivision review? Uh, will the property be developed? Hopefully, they can build a house on it. Okay. And will the recipient of the property be residing on the property? Yes. Great. Thank you. That concludes my staff report. Thank you. And did you have anything additional that you wanted to add? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Great. Um, I had a quick question, Lauren. Um, it looks like there are surrounding tracks as well that don't comply with the growth policy for open and resource that seems a common theme in this correct yeah this area yeah has definitely been developed without accordance to that okay. recommendation of open and resource okay. so yep thank you thanks they are all four acre minimum lots in our covenants so that's why it's of the whole development there so great is that whole development in that designation yep yeah that whole area up there yeah so it doesn't quite quite match <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, any other questions uh, for Lauren or the applicant? Okay, can I get a motion? Oh, oh, pfft. I'm really on today. Public comment. Is there any public comment on the Giles family transfer? I knew there wouldn't be. <laughs> uh, with that, I will close the hearing uh, and entertain a motion. Okay, I would move that we um, approve the request by Brian Giles to utilize the family transfer exemption to create and transfer one parcel to his daughter Miranda T as presented in the exemption application affidavit. I'll second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Up next, I will open the hearing for the Mill Creek Meadows Subdivision Final Plat Amendment with a staff report. Casey Drant here with Community and Planning Services to present the Mill Creek Meadows Subdivision Final Plat Adjustment Request. This request went to the Missoula Planning Board on March 19th, and it's here in front of you today. The representative for this request is WGM Group, and we have Jeff Smith representing the project with us today. Mill Creek Meadows Subdivision, for anyone unfamiliar, is off of Mill Creek Road, just to the east of Frenchtown and Interstate 90. 
This is a look at the subdivision. It has 39 lots with a couple common areas um, located within it. Uh, the roads and any of the houses don't show up yet on this aerial. Uh, it's a relatively um, newly platted subdivision. Uh, this is what the plat looks like. You can see this is for the full subdivision. It was originally a four-phase subdivision. All four phases came in on one final plat. So you see all the lots within the subdivision there. On the face of the plat, the subdivision was originally approved in December of 2008, 2008, and the final plat deadlines for each of the phases were extended on several occasions. The final plat was then recorded on August 8, 2018. And what we are considering here today is a request to remove an easement uh, and associated improvements within the plat. Uh, that easement area is highlighted in yellow on the screen in front of you. It was originally proposed to be an extension of Shelby Renee Lane, which is the main road that comes into the subdivision and provides access to each of the lots. That extension was originally proposed by the applicant with the preliminary plat and then mirrored in the findings and conditions of the original subdivision to create what, would, what could be a potential through connection to the adjacent property to the southeast. And this is just a little bit closer look. Um, what we have there is an access and utility easement. So they're proposing to essentially lift that entire easement off of the plat. So it encumbers two lots currently. It is lots 29 and 30 within the subdivision. And then there would be no improvements within that easement either, whether that be access or utilities in the future. So here's a picture taken yesterday of the end of Shelby Renee Lane where Tyson Way intersects it. Essentially, Shelby Renee Lane would have continued straight across through this picture and would have created a four-way intersection there to create that connection. Um, as we could see from here, that extension of Shelby Renee Lane would not necessarily have provided access to any of the lots within the subdivision. It would have been solely for adjacent property. Both lots 29 and 30 have access off Tyson Way, um, as you can see on the screen in front of you. Um, just some, I know there's been some question about the adjacent property and what may be happening on that adjacent property and the sort of the contemplation of that through connection. Um, the screenshot at, or the uh, picture at the bottom shows you that across that adjacent property. This picture was taken from Tollefson Way, so it'd be at the south corner of the Mill Creek Meadows subdivision looking north. And that extension of Shelby Renee Lane would come out somewhere on that hillside where you see the cows sort of in the background. So it's currently an agricultural tract back there. And I know Jeff has some more information on some of the easements that encumber that property and restrict development out there. Also, in terms of development, the, area, the whole area out here is unzoned. However, when we look at the comprehensive plan for the area, we have an open resource designation within the Frenchtown Ex Activity Center. So um, you, if any development were to come forward in the form of subdivision, uh, it would have to be weighed um, for both the open resource designation as well as that Frenchtown Activity Center, um, which would contemplate sort of the proximity to services within the Frenchtown area. This not being located directly in the center of it and being a little more remote in nature, uh, it seems that that open and resource designation would definitely rise up a little bit in this case. The other access to that property um, owned by Fred Deshaw uh, to the south of Mill Creek Meadows uh, would be Tollefson Way. Uh, there was an improvement made all the way out to the property line that you can see in the photo on the left-hand side. There's been a gate installed there so that people don't continue off into his agricultural land. Um, however, the road comes to a terminus there that's circled in red uh, on the Mill Creek Meadows plat where that photo is taken. Um, there's also a single family home located up there on the agricultural tract, which um, they have access off of Romulus Lane, which is a secondary access for the Mill Creek Meadows subdivision located to the uh, north wet or northeast on the plat there. Um, the plat adjustment or adjustment to a filed final plat is reviewed in accordance with the review criteria on the screen. Staff has found that it complies with the review criteria. Um, with the um, one exception being that it was consistent with the original findings. The original findings for the subdivision do make reference to the through connections there. So staff has made a handful of findings and conclusions in the staff report, um, which we recommend um, as part of this approval here today be carried forward as part of the record to show that there's new findings um, to find that um, it's acceptable to remove this easement area um, based on all the information presented. 
this request was sent out for notice and comment. Um, we had a few comments from county departments, nothing major of note or concern. It doesn't change the sanitation review for the subdivision. Uh, Public Works noted that they would still have two potential access points via Romulus Lane and Tollefson Way to that adjacent property. Uh, the applicant solicited comment from utility providers who would have had the potential to run utilities through that easement. Uh, so they've all provided a statement with the application acknowledging the request to lift that easement area. And it was sent to adjacent property owners, to anyone who owns property within the subdivision as well as within 300 feet of the subdivision. We received one written comment which is included as attachment C to the staff report. That was from the Martellos who live off of Romulus Lane just to the north of Mill Creek Meadows subdivision. Their concern was over access and the potential use of Romulus Lane to any future development that may happen on that adjacent property. Um, staff has noted that uh, any development that does happen there, they would still have to go through the full subdivision review process or whatever other um, processes that may warrant to determine what sort of accesses may be necessary or appropriate for it. And they would have to show legal and physical access just like any other request would to get across there at some point in time. Um, whether they use Romulus Lane or not, it would depend on the scale of the request. Um, Staff has recommended approval of this request. And as I mentioned, this went to planning board back in March and planning board made a unanimous recommendation that it be approved as well. The minutes from the planning board hearing as well as a brief summary memo of that hearing are included with the staff report that you received. And with that, um, I will conclude my staff report. Thank you. Thanks, questions for Casey before we move on to Jeff. All right, can we hear from the applicant or the applicant's representative? Good afternoon, Jeff Smith with WGM Group here representing the applicant. Try and move through this quickly um, and not duplicate what Casey had if I can help it. I thank Casey and the planning board, the agencies and the neighbor who provided comments for this, for this request. I um, just want to add a little bit of context for the request. So as Casey mentioned, Mill Creek Meadows is in Frenchtown. It's, it's situated on a portion of Fred Deshaw's family's ranch. Uh, the Deshaw family manages a productive agricultural operation on the southeast portion of the property, just southeast of Mill Creek Meadows. Over time, they facilitated the creation of homes on their ranch, uh, both north of Romulus Lane and also uh, within the Mill Creek Meadows subdivision. Deshaw family have carved land off of their ownership to facilitate creation of this neighborhood. In the context of rural Frenchtown, Mill Creek Meadows is a dense residential development. The lots here are approximately one half acre in size. To achieve this density, the homes are served by a community drain field system. This community drain field is located in an easement on the property to the southeast, um, that area that is operated by the Deshaw family. Land to the southeast is, as uh, Casey showed is, is pretty hilly. There's a fair amount of topography across the site. It's got steep, undevelopable slopes uh, both to the south along the along the uh, Frenchtown Irrigation District's ditch. If you drive along the interstate, you'll note that large escarpment that leads up to this property. And then along the back side of the property, the slopes that that form the ridge leading up to Charity Peak on the Nine Mile Divide start right just to the just to the east of that pink drain field easement area that we're showing here. In addition to the large community drain field easement, this land contains agricultural buildings, which you can kind of see there is those light brown squares just above the top right of that easement, and an agricultural access along Romulus Lane, and some stock pens down in the south end of this picture. Within the context of the topography, this microphone is funky. Uh, within the context of the topography and the remaining agricultural land, the community drag field, drain field, ag operations, and the potential uh, for future development, the access easement that we're removing where this request is not necessary and would not provide the best connection to the Deshaw land to the southeast. So Casey kind of ran through where the where Fred Deshaw has constructed his agricultural access. It's down near the near the south end of Mill Creek Meadows along Tollefson Lane. He's constructed a gate and uh, 
is using that for his for his operations. That's a lo that's the location that that uh, the Deshia family desired. They signed an affidavit uh, that was submitted along with this request supporting the vacation of the portion of Shelby Renee that we're talking about. Casey gave a brief overview of the streets here, so I won't get into too much detail there. The route, the route from Mill Creek Meadows through to Fred Deshaw's piece fits well within the site topography. We're not, you saw the hill that uh, was shown in Casey's image. There's a fair amount of vertical relief along that Shelby Renee alignment. It also provides a safe route for agricultural traffic through the, through the project. So this is a almost illegible exhibit that uh, I tried to put together this morning, but it shows an agricultural vehicle using that route. I just wanted to demonstrate for everyone the, the appropriateness of the infrastructure that was designed to support agricultural access to that property through the south, rather than being a straight shot through Shelby Renee, which would remove the connection between the two properties. We bring the, bring the traffic through that curvilinear alignment, calm traffic with that route. jumping back here, but I wanted to point out that the distance between the Tollefson Way constructed easement and the portion of easement that we're vacating, it's 585 feet uh, from the Shelby Renee easement that we're vacating to the Tollefson Lane easement. So we're not talking about a, a long distance or much of a savings in travel time. There has been a consistent and recurring concern voiced by a neighbor to the Mill Creek Meadows a neighborhood regarding use of Romulus Lane. It's important to note here that Romulus Lane, the role that Romulus Lane plays in the Mill Creek Meadows neighborhood uh, and for any future development on the Deshaw property. For any purpose other than heading north on Mill Creek Road up, up into, the, into the valley or canyon there, uh, Romulus Lane would be out of direction. The normal, the normal route into or through the subdivision would be coming off of Mill Creek Road through the primary entrance, uh, right where the mailbox is located on the, the primary entrance on Shelby Renee, and then through the subdivision. Mill Creek Meadows is connected to Romulus Lane to provide an emergen emergency secondary point of access in the event of an accident or a wildfire that requires a, a secondary point of connection. That secondary emergency access provided by Tollison Way works works for residents on Romulus, Lay as, Romulus Way as well. It also provides a connection to the 30,000 gallon fire cistern that was installed in Mill Creek Meadows and it serves as a connection to the walking paths that were built in Mill Creek Meadows. There have been several fires in the area and emergency considerations are important for all. Also worth noting just for context, the homes that are north of Romulus Lane are served by drain fields that are in an easement and a common area in Mill Creek Meadows. So there's give and take among both neighborhoods here. We don't always get every detail right when a subdivision comes through the process. This is a request to right size the access to the Deshaw property and it's in line as Casey said with the, with the regulations. Thank you. Um, and Jeff, just to clarify, um, when this subdivision was originally contemplated, there was a difference in where that drain field, the replacement drain field was going to be placed. So it was moved to where now it makes even less sense to have this easement from Thank you. the original. That, that, that is absolutely correct. When the, when the subdivision was originally contemplated, that southern pink area there was, was adequate for the primary and the 100% replacement drain field area. Because of changes in regulations and application rates, we needed a, a larger land area to apply that effluent. So that area to the north is the replacement drain field easement. If you were to imagine Shelby Renee extending down that large bank onto the, onto the property to the southeast, you would run into that replacement drain field easement before you really had room to make a turn and get out of the way. So the, the feasibility of the access was affected by that change in drain field regulations. Thank you. Uh, any questions before we go to public comment for Jeff? So I'm just thinking towards the future, if uh, looking at the land that the Deshaw family owns where the drain fields are, yeah, obviously separate from Mill Creek Meadows, um, what would happen in the future if um, that family or whoever the Deshaws may sell that property to didn't want that drain field, those drain fields there anymore, or wanted to do something with that property um, that was a counter to the interests of the folks in Mill Creek Meadows vis-a-vis -vis those drain fields. 
So when we filed the subdivision, there's there's an easement document that was placed that runs in perpetuity with the land. Yeah. So the the location of those drain fields is is protected through that easement. Uh, there there could be an event where let's say let's say community sewer and a community collection system is extended in a more centralized fashion in Frenchtown, and those no longer become necessary. In that event, that this is valuable agricultural land, uh, it's certainly valuable habitat. The density that that would be supported on that property if those were gone is still in line with the access that remains. So Tollefson Lane is a direct connection to Mill Creek Road. Romulus Lane is an emergency access. So we've we've thought about that also, and I appreciate that question. Got something? All right. Is there any public comment on the Mill Creek Meadows subdivision final plat amendment? All right. Seeing none, I will close that hearing. Make a motion. I'd move that the request for Mill Creek Meadows plat adjustment be approved based on the findings of fact and conclusions of law in the staff report. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right, and lastly, I will move on. Um, I will open the hearing for the cryptocurrency mining interim zoning with a staff report. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners for the record. My name is Diana Manetta. I am Energy Conservation and Sustainability Coordinator for the County and Community and Planning Services. We're going to start with a little bit of background on the topic of cryptocurrency mining. This, some of this will be similar to information that we've presented to the commission before, but given that not everyone here today has been part of that conversation, we thought it was important to start there. So. What is cryptocurrency mining? To answer that, we first have to consider what a cryptocurrency is. A cryptocurrency is a digital currency that's maintained using something called a blockchain. A blockchain is a distributed ledger. Ledger meaning a list of transactions, and distributed meaning it's held not in one central location by a government or a bank, for example, but in many places by many people. Um, in the case of a, of a public blockchain, they could be anonymous located anywhere in the world. Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency created in 2009, and it remains the largest, but there are many others as well. And I should note, there isn't just one blockchain. People sometimes refer to the blockchain as if there's one. There's one blockchain really associated with each cryptocurrency. So when you buy something with cryptocurrency, say Bitcoin, for example, your transaction is grouped together with a bunch of other recent transactions into what's called a block. That block is sent out to all the participants who are involved in maintaining the blockchain. Those participants compete to solve a complex mathematical puzzle associated with that block. There's no tricks involved in solving these puzzles. It's basically a matter of using lots and lots of computational capacity, kind of like generating random numbers until you hit upon the solution. Whoever solves the puzzle first gets to add that new block of transactions to the blockchain and is rewarded with newly issued units of Bitcoin. That reward is their motivation for doing this. This process is called mining because it's how new currency enters into circulation. So in the early years of Bitcoin, mining was something that happened on people's home computers. But over time, as the price of Bitcoin increased, mining got more lucrative and therefore more competitive, and people started doing it on a larger scale, using lots and lots of computers, and specialized computers were developed that just mine cryptocurrency and do nothing else. So what we've seen, essentially, is the centralization of mining in these large operations. So, to get back to the question of cryptocurrency mining operations, in a physical sense, a large cryptocurrency mining operation, as pictured here, is thousands or tens of thousands of specialized computers that were built specifically for this purpose and run 24 hours a day, as well as cooling equipment to prevent those computers from overheating. I should also note, because this mining process is how transactions are verified, I've also heard it referred to as providing security for the Bitcoin network or blockchain security. The technical term for what's happening is proof of work. So 
I mentioned that a blockchain is a ledger that records transactions in a cryptocurrency. All cryptocurrencies use blockchains, but not all cryptocurrencies use the same type of blockchain. They don't all use the proof-of-work based blockchains, and the ones that don't, don't involve what we call mining. They don't involve the type of calculations performed at cryptocurrency mining operations, and they require negligible computational power and negligible electricity compared to the proof-of-work system. Some people believe that cryptocurrency will eventually move away from the proof-of-work system altogether due to the inefficiencies and tremendous energy consumption of proof-of-work in favor of other types of systems. At that point, cryptocurrency mining would no longer be needed. So I think it is important to understand that you can have cryptocurrencies without having cryptocurrency mining. The question comes up frequently, is there a difference between cryptocurrency mining operations and more traditional data centers? Um, and as we've mentioned before, there is a difference physically in these types of operations, and that's due to a difference in their function. Cryptocurrency mining operations process data, but they don't store any data. And therefore, they don't require the same level of security, reliability, and redundancy that you require in a more traditional data center. Um, for that reason, cryptocurrency mining operations are often housed in lightweight buildings like warehouses or storage facilities. They also often use the type of open rack shelving shown in the picture on the left. Um, it doesn't direct the airflow as precisely as the kind of cabinets uh, used in a traditional data center. But that's okay because preserving the lifetime and uptime of the equipment is a lower priority in a cryptocurrency mining operation. To turn to Montana specifically, uh, the cryptocurrency mining industry has shown a lot of interest in the state over the past year and a half or so. Um, we're aware of at least three large cryptocurrency mining facilities currently operating in the state, um, though there's no complete list that we're aware of, so there could be others, um, as well as an unknown number of smaller operations. <coughs> And there's certainly the potential for more. According to Northwestern Energy, as of about a year ago, if all of the facilities that were inquiring with them that were interested um, in setting up cryptocurrency mining operations in the state were to do so, that would total up to 1,000 megawatts of new electrical load in the state of Montana. And that's compared to Northwestern Energy's current load in Montana, which is 1,600 megawatts. So 1,600 current potential up to 1,000. I don't think anyone believes all 1,000 megawatts of that new load will be developed. Um, but even if a small fraction of it was, that would still be really an unprecedented increase in, um, in, in, in the electrical load in the state in a short period of time. The, this industry is interested in Montana due in large part to low electricity rates, the fact that they're able to negotiate low electricity rates here in the state because that is, <coughs> excuse me, such a large um, uh, part of their operating cost. And our cool climate helps as well because it reduces the cooling cost required um, to ensure that the equipment doesn't overheat. Other parts of the country and the world that have seen a lot of cryptocurrency mining um, going on include Eastern Washington, New York State, China, the Republic of Georgia, Iceland, Sweden. This isn't a complete list, but this is some of the places we're aware of that this industry has also uh, moved into. Here in Missoula County, the one large cryptocurrency mining operation currently operating uses as much electricity as about one-third of the households in the county. Uh, that operation has stated its intention to triple in size, at which point it would use about as much electricity as all of the households in the county, according to our estimates. A number of other local governments and utilities around the region have um, chosen to restrict cryptocurrency mining in some way due to concerns about its local impacts, and this is a list of some of those. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jenny to talk about the um, proposed zoning regulations. Thank you. Um, for, the, for the record, Jenny Dixon with Community and Planning Services. And I'm just going to snag that. Um, what I want to do is give a, a brief explanation of the history of the conversation here in Missoula County, what we've been doing in the last year and the discussions that we've had. And then, um, as Diana said, give a uh, give you a description of what the proposed zoning regulations um, are, are that are here before you today for consideration. 
So uh, about a year ago, we were directed to uh, take a look at the cryptocurrency mining industry in Missoula County and its potential impacts. And in June of last year, 2018, the commissioners conducted a public hearing where no action was taken. It was simply a, a taking testimony um, period where uh, folks commented on the pros and cons of the industry in Missoula County. That hearing was continued to September of last year, at which point the commission considered several options. One would have been to enact interim zoning on a temporary basis, which would have uh, placed a moratorium on cryptocurrency mining, new and expanded operations, as well as accessory uses. The second option, which um, which was the option that the commission chose, was to direct staff to investigate development of regulations to target those impacts created by commercial and industrial uses in general. And um, then in March of this year, just a few weeks ago, a public discussion about, again, about the, what those impacts are that we identified and how to develop possible um, interim zoning regulations to mitigate those impacts, which led to today's public hearing on the staff proposal that would um, include an interim countywide zoning district overlay to authorize um, cryptocurrency mining operations under certain conditions. I do want to make note that all the public testimony and publications and materials that were generated in those different public hearings are part of this record as the commission deliberates and takes action possibly today. And um, I also want to emphasize that the proposed, the um, April 4th today's pub, um, proposed zoning regulations are not a moratorium as was considered last fall. The, um, the proposal, however, is in response to an emergency that exists relative to the adverse impacts that um, have been, been identified on life, health, property, and the environment from cryptocurrency mining um, and for which the county has an obligation to take action to protect public health, safety, and general welfare. So the proposed zoning regulations <clears throat> um, would allow cryptocurrency mining in the county subject to four conditions. The proposal allows commercial and industrial cryptocurrency mining in areas zoned for industrial use, either as a conditional use or a special exception. Conditional uses and special exceptions are simply a, an elevated level of, of review for compliance with performance standards to ensure that the community is protected from potential hazards, for example, noise pollution, which this industry has been known to generate. Um, cryptocurrency mining would also, or excuse me, would be required to obtain special exception approval from the Board of Adjustment when the property borders a residential zoning district, excluding roads and other rights of way, or if the property is within 500 feet of a residential property boundary. The uh, next condition is um, e-waste, which if not handled properly can damage human health, water, and air quality, would be required to be disposed of with a DEQ licensed recycler, at least one of which we have identified um, to be located within Missoula County. Last, cryptocurrency mining facilities uh, would be required to develop or purchase renewable energy to offset 100% of the electrical consumption, which Diana will talk about in more detail shortly. This interim zone, if approved, would be effective for a period of one year unless the commission takes action to repeal it prior to the expiration of that of the zone. And it would apply countywide as an overlay zone, but would not include land within the city limits. I want to talk a minute about um, how the zone would apply to what, what we call in the zoning world non-conforming uses. So non-conforming cryptocurrency mining operations are those that um, exist prior to or at the time of the effective date of adoption of these interim zoning regulations. And as you can see here in the blue hexagon, um, these regulations do not apply to existing permitted regula or excuse me, operations. Um, one of which 
we are aware of in Missoula County. As it states, <clears throat> a lawful cryptocurrency mining use existing on the effective date of the ex interim zoning overlay may continue subject to the following conditions. Existing structures may not be enlarged, they, and, they all, and the use of cryptocurrency may, mining may not extend into unoccupied portions of the structure. The cryptocurrency mining operation must conform to zoning if a new operation replaces a current operation, a current operation ceases for 180 or more days, or if the current structure is removed or destroyed and cost of reconstruction amounts to more than 50% of total building replacement cost exclusive of building foundation. And at this point, I want to turn it back over to Diana to give you a little more detail about the renewable energy condition. Thanks, Jenny. So the renewable energy condition reads as follows. These facilities shall be required to develop or purchase sufficient renewable energy to offset 100% of the electricity consumed by the cryptocurrency mining operation. It continues, to meet this condition, the cryptocurrency mining operation must be able to establish that their actions will introduce new renewable energy onto the electrical grid beyond what would have been developed otherwise. We've highlighted that last part because it's the key to understanding this condition. This language is drawing a distinction between new renewable energy and existing renewable energy. So what does that distinction mean and why is it important? First, I want to be very clear that requiring the use of new versus existing renewable energy in this condition is not a judgment about the relative value of new versus existing renewable energy. We are very fortunate to have the existing renewable energy resources that we have in the state of Montana, some of which are pictured here. On average, the electricity that we use in Montana, at least in Northwestern Energy Service territory, is already about 60% renewable. Most of that from hydropower dams, as well as some wind and a little bit of solar. That's a great starting point. But given the urgency of addressing climate change, and the fact that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tells us that we need to phase out fossil fuel combustion entirely in order to avoid catastrophic change, we need to go beyond where we are now. Yesterday, the county adopted a goal of 100% clean electricity for the Missoula urban area by 2030, and the city will con consider the same goal on Monday. So while 60% is a great starting point, we believe that we must go further. So what happens when a new large energy user comes into Montana and buys power from one of these existing renewable energy resources? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, assuming that that renewable energy was previously being used by other people, whether they were in-state or out-of-state, whether they were residential or commercial or industrial, when that new large user comes in, some of those other buyers will need to shift onto another source of generation. And there's no guarantee that that other source will be renewable. It might well be coal or natural gas. So what we've been struggling with is how to reconcile these two things. On the one hand, the large and the, the the fact that this industry is moving into our county with really large energy consumption and on the other hand the imperative to address climate change and what we've come up with is this condition that new or expanded cryptocurrency mining is fine as long as it brings new renewable energy onto the grid with it and meets the other conditions of course that jenny just described and i'll talk shortly about what that means how and how specifically that condition could be met but first, I want to point out that this distinction between new and existing renewables is not one that we in Missoula County have dreamed up or invented. It's a well-established principle among companies who think about these things. For example, 78 large corporations have signed on to the Corporate Renewable Energy Buyers Principles. These are their logos here. There are six of these principles which lay out what these corporations are looking for from utilities and energy providers when they purchase renewable energy. One of those principles is, and I quote, access to new projects that reduce emissions beyond business as usual. These companies make the distinction between new and existing renewable energy because they want to be sure that their use of renewable energy makes a difference. As another example, Google is one of over 150 corporations that have committed to achieving 100% renewable energy. And in fact, Google is one that has already achieved that goal. 
Its report on how it did that includes the statement on the right of the screen there. To ensure that Google is the driver for bringing new renewable energy onto the grid, we insist that all projects be additional. This means that we seek to purchase energy from not yet constructed generation facilities. So again, they're drawing the distinction between new and existing renewable energy. You may also wonder, is it reasonable to expect a business to develop or purchase new renewable energy? Is that a wildly expensive thing to do? Well, Google addresses that question too. Here's what they have to say about it. Purchasing energy from renewable resources makes good business sense for two key reasons. One, renewables are cost effective. They elaborate on that one. And I didn't include all the words here, but essentially there they're talking about the upfront cost of building um, solar or wind. Two, Renewable energy inputs like wind and sunlight are essentially free, which means buying energy from renewables gives us great financial certainty. Again, Google has achieved 100% renewable electricity, so they're saying these things um, with some experience there. Looking at the data, <clears throat> the graph at the bottom there shows how costs have changed for several energy, energy generating technologies over the last decade. I want to point out these are unsubsidized costs. They don't include any kind of subsidy for any of these technologies. The technologies are coal, in, uh, natural gas, solar photovoltaics, and wind. They're levelized costs, which means they take into account both the upfront cost of building the power plant or the wind farm, for example, plus the cost of operating it over time. So that's how you compare these different technologies on equal footing. That's all, all rolled into a, a cost per megawatt hour here. This data comes from Lazard's, which is the world's largest independent investment bank. And as you can see, it shows that the cost of wind and solar, and particularly solar, has dropped dramatically over the last decade. And at this point, according to their data, the cost of building a new uh, wind or solar plant is actually lower on a levelized cost basis than these fossil fuel technologies. Oh, is this one not working? Oh. Is that better? Yeah. So finally, I want to address how a company that wants to meet that wanted to meet the renewable energy condition in these draft regulations could go about doing that, given the electricity sector regulations in our state. This stuff is complicated, so I'll give a brief overview, and then I can certainly delve deeper if the commissioners have any questions. We've identified five potential pathways that a company could pursue to meet the renewable energy condition in the draft regulations. We didn't want to include this level of detail in the draft regulations themselves because we didn't want to be too prescriptive, recognizing that these options may evolve over time and that companies may also identify something not on this list that would also qualify. Also important to point out that not all of these options would be available to every company, as I'll explain. The first one on the list is on-site renewable energy, like rooftop solar, for example. That is limited by available space on a property, as well as shading and other features of a site, um, but it could be a partial solution in some cases. Second, power purchase agreements. In Montana, the vast majority of electricity customers have no choice but to purchase power from the utility that operates in their area. That includes you and me and nearly all businesses in the state. Only a few of the very largest businesses in the state that use more than five megawatts have a choice under state law and can contract directly with a different renewable energy provider than their default utility. They still do pay the utility for the use of the transmission lines. So any cryptocurrency mining operation that falls into this category could choose to enter into a power purchase agreement with the developer of a new renewable energy project, and that would meet this condition. Third, virtual power purchase agreements. This is a mechanism that lots of the big companies, like Google, like the other corporations we talked about, have used to help achieve 100% renewables. It's available to any company, not just those largest energy users in the state. And essentially, it's a financial mechanism whereby the company contracts with a, with a renewable energy developer, which may be located out of state, to pay a fixed rate per kilowatt hour generated by a new renewable energy project. That commitment allows the project to be built. The buyer then turns around and resells the power generated by the project into the wholesale electricity market in the region where the project is located. 
Fourth, green tariffs. This is another one that a lot of those corporations have utilized to achieve 100% renewable energy. It involves working with a utility who typically would put out a solicitation for a new renewable energy project, and utility customers can then opt in to purchase power from that project and be charged for it on their power bills instead of paying their regular rate for their regular utility mix. Um, in utility jargon, I want to point out a tariff doesn't mean a tax. It's just another word for a rate that a utility charges. Several utilities in our region, including Puget Sound Energy in Washington, Rocky Mountain Power in Utah, Black Hills Energy in Wyoming, Excel Energy in Colorado, have developed green tariffs. Finally, last on the list, renewable energy certificates, or RECs. RECs are tradable commodities that represent proof that one megawatt hour of renewable energy was generated. We understand that some REC markets can distingu distinguish RECs generated by new additional projects versus RECs generated by existing renewable energy generators. And in that case, it may be possible for a company to comply with the renewable energy condition through the purchase of RECs. Finally, um, before I close here, I want to address a couple of questions that have arisen in public comment with regard to the renewable energy condition in the draft zoning regulations. The first question that's come up several times has to do with the county's broader goals related to climate change. That includes the goal that the county adopted last month um, for carbon neutrality in, in county operations by 2035, as well as the goal adopted just yesterday for 100% clean electricity for the Missoula urban area by 2030. The question that's come up is, should the renewable energy condition in these cryptocurrency mining um, draft regulations also have a future date, like 2030 or 2035? I think in response to that question, there are a couple of important distinctions to keep in mind. First, these goals, both for county operations and for the Missoula urban area as a whole, relate to our existing operations as a county and as a community. The draft regulations, on the other hand, do not apply to existing cryptocurrency mining operations, only to new or expanded cryptocurrency mining operations. As we move toward 100% clean electricity for our community, we'll, we'll be needing to figure out ways to conserve energy and use it more efficiently. So new, enormous energy users in our area run contrary to this goal unless they bring clean energy with them. I also want to point out in this context the difference between clean electricity and carbon neutrality. Our goal for county operations is carbon neutrality, which includes not just our electricity use, but also our, building, our vehicles, excuse me, and our heating systems and our buildings. The energy condition in the draft regulations, by contrast, is not about carbon neutrality, just about renewable electricity. Um, the second and final question I want to address that has come up is why are these draft zoning regulations specific to cryptocurrency mining operations? Why do they not cast a wider net and address energy consumption more broadly? At the public meeting last month, the commissioners asked staff to look into broader regulations as well, but to start with this industry, given the urgency of addressing climate change and the fact that this industry, according to the information we have, uses so much more energy than any other commercial or industrial facility in the county. A variation on this question is, does the county have the authority to regulate a particular industry like this? And the answer to that, as I understand it, is yes, local governments regulate particular industries all the time through zoning. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Jenny to conclude the staff presentation. This is our last slide, um, and um, just for uh, the commission's information, a recommended motion. But before I get to that, um, I did want to tie up uh, the, the last little bit on public comment and just let you know that we were, as of um, about 1.30 this afternoon, we had received 104 comments, approximately 104 comments, and a little more than two-thirds had ex expressed um, they're being in favor of the interim zoning proposal and about 32% opposed to the interim zoning regulations. Uh, the, the 2016 Missoula County Growth Policy states that local governments should consider the impacts of climate change in policy and regulatory decisions, as well as ensure a right to a clean and healthful environment. And we have tried to go through over the last 
nine to 10 months, all the impacts that we have identified that this industry generates and how to mitigate those impacts and allow this industry to continue but mitigate those impacts for to achieve those goals that I just described from the county's growth policy. Therefore, staff is recommending adoption of these interim zoning regulations with the motion that you see on the screen um, in accordance with the attachment to which are the zoning regulations in your packet. Thank you. Thanks. Does the commission have any um, immediate questions for the staff? All right, um, with that, I will open up public comment on the cryptocurrency mining interim uh, zoning proposal. Um, comments will be limited to three minutes, um, and it is not a debate or question and answer period. It is simply public comment. Um, again, we have received a lot of comment over the ser a series of hearings that we've had, as well as all the written comment. Um, we do have all that in mind, um, and as well as if someone says, before you write what you were going to say, you can say, ditto or something like that to make it move along a little bit more quickly. Um, so with that, uh, I'll open public comment. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Jim Howard. I'm the superintendent at Bonner School. And we are one of the closest neighbors to at least one of the entities that may be under discussion here. I'm not here to take a position one way or the other on this motion. I'm simply here to give a little bit of perspective of the Bonner School District and perhaps some of the community. But um, Bonner School and the Bonner Milltown community have had a long history of connection with industry across the street from our building. Over a hundred years, for over a hundred years, that was a wood products industry. Um, and the community appreciated that relationship for many years. Um, we, we appreciate, I guess, the vision of Mr. Nelson and Mr. Bame in bringing a, a diverse array of economic engine back into the Bonner community through their efforts at the Milltown site. Um, one of the entities that has had an impact of the, on economic growth in our community has been Hyperblock, the Hyperblock industry. They've been a good neighbor. They've taken into account some of the concerns I know of, of much of the neighborhood with, with sound, and we appreciate the efforts they've made in reducing noise. Um, I noted again today, that's a, not an issue as far as the school's concerned. When I walked out to the, uh, my vehicle this afternoon, um, a car probably 300 yards down the road was making more noise just from highway noise than, than any of the fans that I could hear across the street. So we appreciate their efforts in mitigating the sound and the impact that's had. Um, they take an, in, an interest in our students and in our, in our school. And so they've been good neighbors and that's been true of all the industries on that site. So I'm just here to express the appreciation of Bonner School for the fact that the county has had the vision to support growth in our community again and we hope that it can continue that way. Thank you. I think we're taking commenters by row, right? Um, I'm in that row, my turn next. So I'm Gary Matson, a retired businessman and scientist, a grandfather and a 52 year resident of um, the Missoula County. Uh, I just want to thank the commissioners for taking this step and for the work on this much needed document and the county staff. Um, I'm just always impressed by the level of information we get from staff and, and I know that you are as well. And I just want to thank you for doing that and for taking this position. I see no evidence that cryptocurrency mining benefits more than a few people. It is abundantly fair to eliminate the squandering of a precious energy resource we all share and instead require each mine to establish its own new renewable energy resource. Um, climate change is an emergency and I uh, appreciate your efforts in uh, taking action. Thank you. I got it. 
My name is Caitlin Pazersha. I'm here on behalf of the Montana chapter of the Sierra Club, uh, which would like to voice support for these emergency zoning regulations. We believe this is a necessary and important step um, to manage intensive electricity consumption as we move towards a clean electricity transition. I'm also here on behalf of myself as a member of multiple climate concerned organizations in Missoula, a recent alum of UM, and a resident who is deeply concerned about the impact of climate change on the future of our state, um, our country, and our world. As mentioned, Yesterday, you voted to commit Missoula to a goal of 100% clean electricity by 2030. Um, the room was packed with supporters, and several dozen organizations and businesses added their names to a sign-on letter in favor, including the Missoula Food Bank and Garden City Harvest. The Associated Students of UM passed a resolution in support on behalf of UM's entire student body. And several more organizations and businesses, including Missoula Federal Credit Union and Providence St. Patrick's Hospital, wrote their own letters of support. A lot of the organizations who voiced their support recognize and fear the impact of unrestrained climate change on our community's health, wellness, water, air, and ability to access food and basic resources. They also represent a subsection of the hundreds of organizations and individuals who are already striving towards a vision of 100% clean electricity and a livable future for all Missoulians in various ways. Um, so I encourage you to continue upholding the vision for our community's future you just voted to approve. The commitment to take swift action to address climate change as a county does not mean much if we allow businesses within Missoula County to dramatically increase energy consumption without adding additional renewable energy to the grid. Um, since cryptocurrency mining uses an exorbitant amount of energy and is significantly increasing overall energy usage in Missoula, it's important to regulate that activity such that it does not undermine the goals um, you have approved in the interest of our community's future. So we see these regulations as an important step forward in navigating the challenges before us um, and thoughtful, necessary regulations, and I urge you to approve them. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Bert Lindler, a resident of Grant Creek. Uh, first, I'd like to just uh, make a short philosophical statement I uh, do not believe that electricity can be produced without environmental cost, whether it's renewable or not. If we produce uh, electricity with hydroelectric power, it's often at the cost of our streams. If we produce uh, electric power with wind energy, it's often at the cost of open landscapes, skyscapes, and sometimes the deaths of migratory birds or bats. Uh, given those very real costs of producing electricity, I, I have a deep philosophical concern with virtual benefits. So when I see real benefits and real cost, I can understand the trade-offs. When I see real cost and virtual benefits, I don't get it so well. Secondly, I would like to express my geographic concern, my not in my backyard concern. So wait a minute, Grand Creek, how could I be discussing this as a backyard issue when the big operation is in Bonner? Uh, some months ago, I began seeing uh, shipping containers deposited on open ground uh, near Motel 6 at the mouth of Grand Creek. And as I inquired, I learned that these shipping containers were going to be the basis for another cryptocurrency mine in Missoula County. As I looked at the maps, I, I realized that the shipping containers were 100 or 200 yards outside the city limits. So there'd be no city regulations. The regulations would have to be in the county. When I checked uh, to find out what regulations might uh, apply, it wasn't so obvious because this really hasn't been foreseen in the past and we're witnessing some of the action that has taken place since. So I thank you for your work and uh, hope that you will uh, adopt interim zoning. Thank you. My name is, is this on? 
My name is Erin Miller, and I am with the Ford Montana Foundation, and we work with thousands of young people across the state, especially here in Missoula County. So um, because of that and because of our futures, I urge the commission to support this. Thank you. Commissioners, my name is Sky Borden. I'm the State Director of Environment Montana, and I am also here to support this regulation. Um, yesterday, it was my absolute honor to attend, along with Caitlin and a bunch of other folks in this room, the Committee of the Whole Hearing, and watch you make history. In front of a packed crowd, you and the City Council supported a bold vision for a greener, healthier Missoula one that is powered solely by clean, renewable energy. That commitment was a huge step forward and it's worth celebrating. But today the hard part begins, right? Today and every day after it, we have to take concrete steps that bring us closer to meeting that goal and to creating the world we want to live in. And that is not gonna be easy. Climate change is an unprecedented challenge, and the solutions we create will have to be bold and innovative enough to match it. I think we're up for it. And I think that with the help of critical regulations, just like this one, we can create the future that our community wants. But we have to be diligent, we have to be brave, we have to seize every opportunity. And I think this, today, is one of those opportunities that we can't afford not to seize. So I hope you'll do the right thing and support it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, staff. Um, my name is Eric Husef. I'm a pastor at Our Savior's Lutheran Church in Bonner, right across from uh, the mill and the cryptocurrency mining operations. Economic development is extremely important for our Bonner community, and the redevelopment of the mill has been incredibly vital to the growth of this area. And I believe that Mike Bain and Steve Nelson truly desire to be good neighbors. Um, and I want to thank them for working to address the challenges that have arisen from hyperblock uh, development, many of which were unseen. However, future intentional development of cryptocurrency facilities in Missoula County might not have as thoughtful of neighbors as Mike Bain and Steve Nelson. And so, as a county, I believe we have the important task of creating a healthy and flourishing community for not only ourselves, but for our children and for our grandchildren. And that's where I want to leave uh, today. I support the, this uh, zoning regulation. I speak not only as a pastor, but as a young father, a father who is very concerned about the world that his son will inherit, his one-year-old son. And so with that, I hope that you take that into account uh, of this time and this zoning. And thank you very much for hearing me. Hi, my name is Erica Peterman. I'm an attorney for Bonner Development and for Mike Fame and Steve Nelson. And it's interesting that he said that he's the pastor at our Savior's Lutheran Church because I moved here in 1983 and my dad was a pastor at a Lutheran church in Missoula. And we spent a lot of time out at the, out at the house that was associated with that church and have seen Bonner change so much. And I'm also here as a person who has lived in Missoula for the majority of my life. And I think that there is no greater emergency in our world than clean energy and finding renewable energy sources. And I think that everybody in this room agrees on that. I know that Mike and Steve do. I know that Hyperblock does. I think that the issue that Mike and Steve have, which is Bonner property development, is how we're getting there. Mike and Steve bought this property in 2011. And since that time, they have grown this property, I think, beyond any of our wildest imaginations. In, two th in 2011, or I'm sorry, in 2012, the first business was there. In 2015, Kettle House Brewery went out there, and now the amphitheater is out there. And from somebody who went to a Nylons concert at the old Wilma Theater in seventh grade, like to see what's growing out there and the opportunities that my kids also have is pretty phenomenal. 
25 businesses rent property out there right now, including Close to Pedicab, the Missoula Children's Theater, Planetary Designs, Kettle House, and of course, Hyperblock, which is why we're here today. Mike and Steve, and I think their frustrations and my frustrations is they have continually been willing to work with the county on these issues. As the superintendent testified earlier, they have been more than willing to address issues of fan control and noise control and want nothing more than to work with the county commissioners and to work with the city of Missoula to address anybody's needs and to make it a thriving area in the Missoula County. The 2016 growth policy had certain objectives and the main objective was to spur economic development. It included language requiring encouraging clean technology, including clean technology firms and the reason they entered into a long-term lease agreement, which they have with Hyperblock, is because they had that encouragement from the county. They've also invested most of their life savings and all of their energy into making both the Hyperblock industry a, a viable industry, which I think it is, especially among a younger population and as an alternative to the current financial industry. But they also thought what they were doing was also at the support of the county. Their concern is that if these interim regulations pass, it isn't going to it might cause Hyperblock to cease its expanded its its operations in the future and could potentially cause Bonner Property Develop and Mike and Steve to fold as well. And that was a huge impact, I believe, on the Missoula community and a Missoula County in that area of Missoula that I think everybody wants to continue to see grow and prosper. I don't think this is a case where people are on opposite sides of the issue, like I said earlier. Everyone here agrees that a commitment to clean energy needs to be a top priority. But an emergency, there's a global emergency, and I think in the history of the world, there, there is an emergency. But whether that's an emergency under the law and under Title 76 of Montana statute, I think those are different things, and I think that really needs to be considered when we're thinking about whether to pass these interim regula regulations. And you're at three minutes. Um, that's all then. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Mark Anderlich. I live in Missoula. And uh, uh, I rise in support of the emergency regulations uh, zone cryptocurrency operators in Missoula County. I do have uh, some written testimony because I have some uh, reference notes. I did a little bit of research. I've been following cryptocurrency as an industry uh, for a couple of years and did uh, look through a couple of economic notes uh, in terms of what this industry actually is. So, um, and <clears throat> there's a number of alarming aspects of cryptocurrency as an industry. First, none of the more than 3,000 or so currencies are much of a currency as none of them can be actually used widely to buy things. Recently, Expedia quietly ended its, its experimental acceptance of cryptocurrency, for example, after trying it for several years. Second, uh, cryptocurrencies are notoriously volatile in their value. So if they become used widely, they would be very impractical to say the least. Um, Joshua Eisenman, the Doxon Chair in Economics and International Relations at the University of Southern California recently wrote, the fall in valuation of Bitcoin has led to a debate over whether decentralized currencies can be re reliably stable. This column argues that in contrast to the successes of inflation targeting regimes, uh, which is like the Federal Reserve, there is no feasible path towards stability of a decentralized currency. The instability of cryptocurrencies is the outcome of a systemic tragedy of the commons coordination failure. This is inherent in their design, end quote. Third, cryptocurrencies are very exposed to being stolen or manipulated or simply lost, contrary to the claims made by those in the industry. According to a recent study done by a team of economists, they conclude the surge of interest in cryptocurrencies has been accompanied by a proliferation of fraud, largely in the form of pump and dump schemes. Uh, this study provides the first measure of the scope of such schemes across cryptocurrencies. The results suggest that the phenomenon is widespread and often quite profitable and highlight the need for concerted efforts from industry and government regulators to fight cryptocurrency price manipulation." End quote. Fourth, in no way does cryptocurrency provide improvements on the current fiat money system overseen by sovereign national governments, even when it comes to secrecy. 
Peter Boffinger, Professor for Monetary and International Economics at Würzburg University, a member of the German Council of Economic Experts, writes, quote, a monetary system with national currencies issued under a sovereign mon monopoly should end up being more stable than a system of currency competition with a large number of currencies issued by private actors. And in terms of data protection and banking secrecy, the quote, distributed ledger, which forgets nothing and at least makes everything transparent for professionals, proves to be highly questionable anyway, end quote. And lastly, Jim Chanos, founder and managing partner of the New York-based Kynikos Associates and has spent much of his career studying financial fraud, last year in an interview said, in the new Bitcoin and crypto craze, the whole idea is we need to get away from fiat currencies by creating our own fiat currency for which there is no lender of last resort, no third party adjudicator. For those who believe it's a store of value in the coming apocalypse, the idea is that you're going to have to safeguard your key under a mountain with fingerprint and eye scan security while the hordes are outside your bunker trying to get in to use it. For you're also I at three minutes, sir. Okay. For what, I have no idea, because for those who believe that you need to own digital currency as a store of value in the worst case scenario, that's exactly the case in which a di digital security currency will work the least, food would work the best. And he summarizes by saying, this is simply a security speculation game masquerading as a technological breakthrough in monetary policy. So please pass this res regulation and uh, I wish you could do more, but uh, this would be a great start. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, uh, my name is Steve Nelson. I'm uh, the uh, one of the owners of Bonner Property Development. Just a few comments. Uh, one, I. Uh, I think we had all signed this 30 year in 2030 that uh, we at uh, Bonner would be 100% uh, 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 carbon neutral. I, I, I don't know whether Hyperblock would, but we sure would. Uh, two weeks might be a little bit short. And uh, so if you enact this, uh, I think that's going to be a problem. Uh, my view is, is that I don't know why. Uh, we've shown that as a uh, uh, developers and and, uh, and and hyperblock that we were willing to sit down we showed you how we could work with you guys on the uh, the noise issue with the uh, cooling fans and uh, why why didn't we get together and do that why didn't we sit down and have a conversation about it instead of a big you get a uh, suddenly you get a uh, emergency zoning that comes along and you're going to kind of ram it down our throat and I just I frankly don't, don't think that's fair. And do I take it personal? I do take it personal. Because if you put Hyperblock out of business, I think you're going to put us out of business. And uh, I don't think that's uh, certainly something that I'm very excited about. And I think there's a lot of people in the community out there and there's about 400 people working out there that wouldn't be very excited about it either. So I would urge you to not uh, pass this now. I would urge you to maybe take some time, sit down, maybe with industry and ourselves, and maybe we can figure out a way to uh, accomplish our goals and do it so everybody's happy. Anyway, that would be my thank you. Thanks. Um, and to clarify, Hyperblock's current operations would not be affected by the proposal. Excuse me. Can I answer that real quick? Are you saying that uh, they could expand and there wouldn't be anything affected? No, I said their current operations. Right. And that's the problem is because at their current operation, they probably couldn't survive because they came here with the idea that they were going to be able to grow their operation. It's like anybody else. When Roseburg started, they didn't start as big as they are today. When a lot of companies start, they don't start as big as they are today. They have a plan. They have a goal to grow to a certain level. And uh, if you don't let them grow, they're not going to make it. Thank you for that clarification. Any further public comment? Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Amy Solberg. I'm the executive director at Climate Smart Missoula, and thank you for the opportunity to briefly comment. Um, I'm here to lend my support and our organization's support to Missoula County's proposed action to establish the countywide interim zoning regulations. And 
Over the past year, I've really been impressed with how the county, they've done an exempt, you guys have done an exemplary job looking into the issues and impacts associated with the growth of cryptocurrency industry in our county and beyond and looking what everybody's doing around the world um, on this issue. It's um, pretty exciting to see how we can learn from others and even chart a new path to adequately and fairly address these um, concerns. Um, as we all know, we were in the same room yesterday. It was a momentous day when the city of Missoula and Missoula County voted together um, to pass a resolution to transition to 100% clean electricity. And, you know, I'll ditto what um, Sky Borden had said with, you know, this is where the rubber meets the road. We have to start that, that transition today um, to do our part to address the staggering issue of climate change. Um, I will note that we showed you a boundary of where that um, resolution fit and, and Bonner is part of that. Um, of that boundary of the area for which we speak um, in yesterday's resolution. Um, the proposed interim zoning regulations are consistent with this resolution, with the vote yesterday, requiring additional renewable electricity generation for new cryptocurrency enterprises we just discussed, um, aligns with these new goals set forth last night and with other Missoula County established vision statement goals and planning efforts. Um, and I really appreciate that fact that, you know, we have lined out that this isn't a say no, this is explore these different um, green tariffs, power purchasing agreements, and the like that Diana Manetta spoke to. Um, I've been impressed how other corporations and businesses have gone down those paths and very quickly established ways to purchase this new renewable energy. It doesn't have to take years in order to um, to bring on that additional clean energy. And I think that is exactly what this interim zoning would would request that that these new companies or these expanded or new enterprises, um, you know, look into and quickly establish. Um, so it is incumbent upon us to act prudently and in alignment with the Missoula County's goals. And I thank you for considering this. Uh, hi, my name is Jason Vaughn. Uh, I'm the site manager uh, with Hyperblock. Uh, I'm a local Missoulian along with the majority of our employees. Uh, I graduated here at the University of Montana and degree in information systems. Prior to coming on to Hyperblock, uh, I worked at a computer, managing a computer business here for 15 years. And I was offered the opportunity to interview with Hyperblock, which was then Project Spokane. Um, and I took on that interview because I was basically at a dead-end job after 15 years working here in Missoula in a, in a technology job. Uh, I plateaued on how much I could make. Uh, I have five kids, a wife, and basically we live in a community that doesn't have good paying jobs. Um, this was a huge opportunity for me. Uh, I did computer work for Steve Nelson for over a decade and he said, hey, come out, check out these guys. Um, so basically, I came out there, I interviewed, uh, and was offered a job out there where I ended up making more than twice what I was making after 15 years uh, on my first year. Um, I was able to uh, get into a position that's better for me, my family, as well as all our employees. And I, I keep hearing all this stuff about there's only a handful of employees. It's not, there, there's not hundreds of employees. We don't. We have a small handful of employees. but. We pay those employees very well, uh, better than what most people in, in the area uh, make starting out at a job. Uh, we have livable wage jobs. Uh, that's something that's just not around Missoula much anymore. People don't look at that. Um, I think we have worked very diligently with the community in attempting to take care of any issues that came about. Uh, the sound issue came about. Um, that was the first thing I took on when I got there. Uh, it was it was rough. It was difficult. You know, I was dealing with a, a public that was not happy with us. Um, but we plan on being here long term. That's our goal. And so we wanted to take care of the issue and be good neighbors. Um, you know, so we took care of the sound issue. Uh, people have been happy with that. We work with uh, Bonner School. I do a lot of uh, work with our 3D print program. You know, um, we do. Uh, other stuff within the community, the YMCA. Um, so we're, we're involved in the community and we want to be here long term, uh, but it's hard when we're being, the rules are changing midstream. 
we are already in the middle of looking to expand. Every, you all know that. We've been talking about that for over a year now. And so we're kind of knee deep in this already. And you guys are trying to change the rules partway through. That makes it very difficult when we've had a plan set out, budget set out, uh, and a way, you know, our path forward, you're trying to change. That puts my livelihood at risk, uh, the livelihood of all our employees. Um, so I'm asking for you guys to please reconsider the emergency interim zoning and bring us to the table. Let's discuss this. We all want the same thing. We all want uh, clean energy. We all, we all want the same thing. But again, you guys have blindsided us with uh, just kind of out of nowhere. Um, you guys have not invited us to the table. Uh, and that's just, that, that hasn't been fair. We want to do things right. In fact, we thought we were doing things right by, by already buying uh, hydroelectric power. Uh, you know, we've been doing that. Um, as a business, we want to become more efficient. I mean, that's, that, that's just part of the business. But we also want to be good neighbors, and we want to be clean as well. But we need to sit down and talk about how we're going to do that without putting us at risk of, of going out of business or harming our, our business. So the other thing, one real quick thing too. And you are at four minutes. Oh, sweet. Thanks. I posted a comment with a bunch of links of information just on cryptocurrency and blockchain technology for the public on the comment section, just to do some research. There's so much negativity. I'd like people to see some of the positive aspects of it. I just want to ask a quick question. You mentioned number of employees and wages. Could you just say what those were? How many employees and roughly what they're getting paid? Uh, we have 19 empl full-time employees, and uh, wages start out, I think, around $16 an hour to start. Um, and, and, you know, management makes better than that, so, yeah. Clint Burson, I'm here representing the Missoula Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the Missoula Chamber of Commerce stands opposed uh, to the entering zoning regulations concerning cryptocurrency, uh, mostly due to the policy precedent that it would set and the potential harm that could do to future economic development efforts in Missoula. Um, I've submitted written comments, so I won't go through all of them. The only thing I will um, make sure to reiterate is that the Chamber really understands the challenges that are posed by uh, this particular industry, uh, but we would hope that you would uh, look to find a more equi equitable solution to addressing some of those issues and concerns rather than targeting a very narrow sector of the technology industry. Thanks. Is there any more public comment? Commissioners, thank you very much. My name is Jamie Bowditch. Um, I, for the record, I am the attorney representing Hyperblock. Uh, I've been up here testifying a number of times. I'll try to keep my comments brief. Um, this is a, an incredibly complicated issue. And uh, I, I will, kudos to Diana for, you know, mentioning all the information about the electrical grid. But it's even far more complicated than that. And I think the frustration exhibited by Steve uh, is mirrored by myself in that here we are adopting emergency interim zoning regulations when no emergency even exists on a very, very, very complicated issue without involving all of the players and having a discussion is how that affects everybody and perhaps ways we can do it better that accomplishes more. And what I, what I really want to emphasize is you're doing so, I understand that you're targeting a sector of the, biz, of the uh, 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 business, but you're really targeting one business. I mean, that's the only business that exists that's going to be affected by these regulations. And that business right now, and I know it's been stated, but I don't think it can be overstated, buys 100% renewable energy. They always have, they're committed to doing so, and they invested a lot of money and a lot of contract time, and they are contractually committed for a long period of time to continue to do so. And how, why we're sitting here today and punishing them effectively by adopting regulations 
based on an emergency that really doesn't exist. And as Erica adequately pointed out, you've, you've got to have an emergency. There has to be an emergency for you to adopt interim zoning regulations. And, and I, I'm struggling here to try to figure out what that emergency is when you've got a company who has demonstrated that it's currently purchasing 100% renewable energy, so it's, it's not a contributor to climate change. Their operations don't contribute to climate change. They've satisfied on their own without any, any uh, government regulation and through great expense to themselves all of the requests regarding the noise abatement, one of the other things that the interim zoning regulations say are an emergency that needs to be addressed, and they are already recycling their e-waste with one of the very few licensed DEQ e-cycling centers in the state. So I come to you again, I say, what is the emergency? Well, the answer is there is none. And if there is none, you can't adopt these regulations. I, I, I'd like to get into some of the electricity part, but I, like I said, it's just, this is not the format to do so. This requires, I, I thank Diana and Jenny for the opportunity to meet with us briefly, and I think she's adequately portrayed the um, options available for purchasing green energy, but you're imposing those restrictions or those obligations on a company that already does that. And I will say that I think that the concept that the green energy being acquired currently by Project Spokane necessarily displaces somebody else from the ability to do so is incorrect. I mean, you've, you've got to look at the electrical grid in its entirety. I mean, we're not talking about renewable energy that only exists in Montana and the ability to buy green energy from Montana. The way energy or renewable energy certificates work is that you are acquiring them from any utility supplier located throughout the country. And so, thank you. I, I will, I'll wrap up here. Um, so my point is that it's much more complicated than I think anybody realizes, and for that we need to take our time. I, nobody disagrees, including myself, including my client, that climate change is important, but this is not the way to do it. We need to get all the parties at the table, government officials, federal, large corporations, energy company representatives, utilities, suppliers, and proceeding in that manner instead of this, because doing so this way is gonna result in only one thing, and that's what I'm fearful of, and that's a lawsuit, and I don't wanna see that happen. So we reiterate the request that we've had before, which is let's involve a situation where we all sit down and talk about this and figure this out, because it'll be far more effective that way. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Mike McGowan, uh, independent uh, business guy here in Missoula. Thanks for the opportunity to visit with you. Um, I have just a couple of comments. I actually reiterate uh, Steve as well as Jamie's comments that you uh, reconsider and you give this give this uh, subject an opportunity. I uh, have not. I've had the opportunity to go through June 4th, September 27th, and March 14th presentations in somewhat great depth. And quite frankly, I'm a little confused in some areas and and have comments on the other. I have uh, the lack of quantitative da data points and references have been fairly alarming, uh, specifically to electrical uses in Missoula County versus cryptocurrency mining. I don't know where they come from. Uh, data center operations for as far as mining center operations. What are those quantitative numbers? Uh, we're not going to stop using computational electricity, and I think it would be good to bring those quantitative numbers to the to the table. The last part is uh, the majority of the references that I have seen in this material really come from one source, uh, two different names, Digiconomist and Bitcoin Energy Consumption Index, primarily by the name of Alex DeVirus. And um, it's very interesting because Mr. The virus, who's a uh, gentleman from the Netherlands, um, makes some fairly huge claims. For instance, additional research published in the Natural Climate Change even suggests that Bitcoin mining alone could push global warming above two centigrade within less than three decades. That's a pretty big statement. He goes on by saying uh, that half a billion people who might be mining Bitcoin without ever even knowing it. I have the references, by the way. 
Finally, he goes on and says uh, uh, he's famous for making claims that Bitcoin operations consume as much more energy than smaller countries. And you kind of kind of fill in the blank, depending on who his audience is, whether it's Switzerland, Ireland, again, limited to no reference points in his comments. Let me tell you what a real scientist says. That this is Jonathan, Jonathan Kumi. He says that the... Uh, by the way, he is the chief scientist to the Rocky Mountain Institute. He's a lecturer of Earth Systems and uh, at the School of Earth and Energy and Environmental Studies at Stanford University. He says, Mr. Uh, Veris, de Veris's work is fundamentally flawed. That is the majority of reference points in your material. Over five, I went through and counted them. There's three uh, specific ones. Most, uh, most of them... Uh, most of the reference were educational, and I appreciate the um, the time and effort that you've put into them, but those are specifically flawed based on what this particular person says, not me. He's certainly smarter than I am, but he goes on. He says, any time that you do not, you do, um, he said, they're fundamentally flawed because you back into Bitcoin's power consumption by estimating miners' revenues and expenses. Quote, any time you do that, you introduce multiple layers of error and uncertainty. It is a completely unreliable way to do the analysis, and no credible energy anal analyst would ever do that. Doing these wild exploitation, exploitations can have a real-world consequence. He said that, um, by the way, Mr. Uh, Professor Kumney at Stanford is the, uh, the gentleman that pioneered studies of electricity usage from IT equipment and helped debunk uh, faulty forecast in the 1990s. You're at three minutes and 30 seconds. Okay, I will go to, uh, I will finish this out then. Um, MIT uh, also has come in on this particular uh, subject. Many of these calculations that you see today are based on very weak assumptions. Based on that, I would just ask for you to reconsider the data points that were only represented in the material. Again, that is uh, June 14th, September 27th and March 14th. It's time to have an open dialogue, and I would really appreciate the opportunity to do that. Thanks for the opportunity. Any further public comment? Is, is your mic on, sir? Is that a red light or a green light? There we go. Uh, Dale Mayhew, Northwestern Energy. I stood before you about three weeks ago and indicated that Northwestern Energy is not taking a stand one way or another in this situation that you're pondering today. However, we would like to go ahead and make sure that everyone is treated fairly through this process. And as I become more involved in it, it seems like that maybe there's some more discussion that needs to take place before a far-reaching and overreaching decision may be made. Hyperblock, formerly Project Spokane, has been a very good customer of ours. They have done everything according to the book, according to rule and policy, and has been a very good customer since its inception. And I would just hate to see a decision that is made here today, potentially, that could have more far-reaching effects to other customers or perceived effects on other customers in the future. So uh, ponder this heavily uh, before you do make your decision, if you would, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, I'm Dan Stivers. I'm the um, Mining Operations Manager at Hyperblock. And I wanted to start off today by just being very clear. We are on the same side of the fence here when it comes to issues of the environment. I think the core issue is how do we get there? And I think that's where a lot of our problems uh, come in. And I'm, what I'm observing is we have a primary blurring of two issues. One, the value judgment or rather around regarding whether you agree or you don't agree with the crypto mining industry versus greenhouse gas contribution. I think it's very important that we keep these two things separate. 
it's not the place, uh, in my opinion, of the county commissioners nor the community to dictate to a business whether it has the right to pursue some new technology that's completely legal, that they do everything by the book or not. That's a completely separate issue. The issue should remain focused on why this emergency is being called around greenhouse uh, contribution. So approximately two weeks ago, we're informed that there's this emergency and that uh, we are this indirectly must be this mighty greenhouse gas contributor because we're one of the larger consumers of power. Yet within this emergency is declared, there is no determination of where is the greenhouse emissions actually coming from. Instead, it's just, oh, it must be hyperblock. We, we hide behind this guys, uh, we're targeting an industry, but no, we're targeting a single business here is the bottom line. And you keep referring to your mitigating impacts. Yet there is no recognition that Hyperblock has led the use of renewable energies far ahead of the county, far ahead of most any other business from day one. And not only that, but then we talk about, oh, they're releasing carcinogens in the environment, da, da, da. We've used a DEQ <laughs> licensed certified recycler from the beginning, from the beginning. Yet there's this emergency that we need to do this interim zoning because of the contributions we're contributing, contributing to greenhouse gas, yet we use all renewable. But somehow none of that's enough. But instead, and the community gets blurred, I mean, half the comments are referring to, or not literally half, but a large number are referring to that we're fossil gas users, yet that gets counted in the tally at the beginning of this, 64% for, 38% against, or whatever it was. Uh, you read the issues, I'm in favor, I'm in favor. There's no substance behind these. No one's actually looking at the detailed data of what's actually happening here. And we've said from the beginning, we this issue is important. We could have used coal strip energy, just like the county does. It was cheaper, but we didn't do it. And that was multiple years ago. Yet we are being persecuted as if we don't care about the environment. And whether you agree with what we're doing or not, that's irrelevant. Whether the county agrees, it's irrelevant. There are millions of people that are for it. It's like any new emerging technology. All right. It is creating value. A viable business model's been built around this. If we had not come in as the anchor tenants in Bonner, there would be no mill as you know it today. And you guys want to just take that away over inaccurate value judgments? And most of the information in the presentation, I'll enter Mike, it's not fully accurate. It's a very biased presentation about what this industry is about one way. And you're at four minutes. Okay. Thank you for, thank you for that. So uh, I'll just uh, wrap up with... Why are we structuring regula regulation that would cause great harm to specific business and not addressing the actual issue? Thank you. Hello, my name is Anna Weinberg and I'm here today as a concerned citizen. Um, I would like to just briefly speak to that point. As Eric Youssef uh, mentioned earlier, um, in Bonner, that hyperblock has been a good neighbor and has taken in concerns, but the issues with these regulations are taking into account other future neighbors, other future facilities that are coming into our Missoula County community and might not be as likely to work closely with these other community members, with the schools, with the church, um, and that's uh, a point of concern for the future. Um, there's also been a lot of discussion of how most everybody in this room, regardless of if, what side they are on these proposed regulations, are in favor of clean energy. But uh, there's a lot of words and not actions when those kind of statements a lot of times in these conversations that, as many people have noted, the hard work starts now. And we fully acknowledge that that is hard and we all have to figure this all out together. But the argument that more time is always necessary to make sure that all 
sides and angles and every side of the issue are taken into account. I feel like sometimes discredits the work that the county staff have taken into account, have done over many meetings, many uh, days and days of effort into looking at this issue. And so it's important to acknowledge that. Um, and to finish off just briefly, uh, just to reiterate again what um, Commissioner Stromeyer said yesterday that this is an emergency. Uh, we can't say that we are in favor of clean energy and discount this and discredit the situation as a non-emergency. Um, everything related to this issue of the clean energy transition is very uh, necessary and needs to move very quickly. And that's why we acknowledge the difficult situation that you all are in in making these decisions. So thank you so much for your time and thank you so much to the county staff for all of the work that they've put into this discussion. Any more public comment? Oh. People just like hearing me ask that question before they stand up, I guess. Good afternoon, my name is Ross Ronaldo. I run a small business here in Missoula and of that business, uh, four of my employees are or work directly for Hyperblock in the business modern property development. Uh, additionally, my wife is an employee of an architect and engineering, fir engineering firm, which has done the electrical engineering for Bonner property and Hyperblock. Uh, we're grateful for that because they're helping keep my business afloat. Um, without them, we may also go under, sadly. Uh, we are very small and we only cover the state of Montana. So they're a big contributor to keeping our business alive. Um, my biggest concern today is the, the zoning regulations are almost forbidding new technology. Two of the companies that were listed up there as being uh, committed to renewable energy are producers of mining equipment. So their goal is to create more efficient equipment to use less energy. And by putting these restrictions on there permit, prohibits them from being able to buy more efficient energy consumption equipment. Um, lastly, I'm confused at what constitutes a facility because we could turn any of these computers into a mining rig. I could go home and turn all of my computers into mining rigs. So how are we going to enforce it if anybody can do it at this point. And at what level does this zoning apply? That's all I have, thank you. Any more public comment? All right, last call for public comment. Hello, hello, uh, county commissioners. Um, I have no real opinion on Hyperblock as a business. Um, it sounds like they're trying to do the right thing. It sounds like they're the anchor of many businesses out in Bonner. And I think it was wonderful to hear from the Bonner School and people supporting this business. I am uh, neutral in terms of how I feel about uh, Hyperblock as a viable business or as a currency. Um, I have a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resources Planning, and I think that planning and zoning is a fine way of putting our community and our county forward in issues that come up um, when it comes to um, businesses that may be uh, something new, something innovative, uh, that we're not quite sure how to move. And I find uh, I am totally in support of this special overlay. And I think that uh, zoning and planning is a really good way to do that. So um, and I sent in comments and I just wanted to say that zoning is a really good way to handle this. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry. Carla Abrams. Thank you. Any further public comment? Last call again. All right, uh, with that, we will close the hearing. Are there questions or comments from the commission? Yeah, I'll just make a few overview comments. So I guess first off, thanks Jenny and Diana for uh, the, the great work that you've done 
not only today, but at the previous uh, meetings that we've had on this topic. It's been uh, extremely helpful, and I appreciate your your uh, research, well-researched insights. And yes, absolutely, I will. I will try. Th thanks for the cue, uh, Bert. Um, so again, thanks to staff for all the work that you've done, and uh, and uh, thank you for everyone who turned out today. I'm extremely uh, encouraged that I have not heard a single climate change denier uh, come to the microphone today, and that uh, that it is it's a step in the right direction that we're at least kind of uh, uh, congealed around the idea that that climate change is real, that it's uh, that's a, a significant thing that we need to address as a uh, as a species here on the planet uh, in contrast to some of the comments though I, I heard I would say that it absolutely is a planetary emergency and it's an emergency right here in Missoula County and we have seen the impacts of climate change uh, right here within the confines of uh, of uh, the area between the Bitterroot and the Bob Marshall Wilderness, and and it's incumbent upon us to do the important work, the the heavy lifting that really does begin today. It was easy to say yesterday that we'd commit ourselves to 100% clean electricity by 2030. It's uh, a little more challenging to start that implementation. Uh, I would also say that. Uh, uh, this is not the end of the story today. What we're contemplating is interim zoning and concurrent with that, we're going to be looking at and, and rolling out a process to adopt permanent zoning. And I would fully expect that everyone in the room here today and folks who feel like there was not adequate time uh, to contemplate today's action will be at the table to talk about how we can, uh, if necessary, fine tune this regulation uh, for the long haul, but this is a means to give us some decision space because we have committed ourselves to some ambitious and bold goals relative to addressing climate change and uh, and we need to start that uh, that process today. What we do have today, I will also add, is a much more nuanced approach to interim zoning than what was contemplated uh, a year ago, which was a flat out moratorium. I really do thank the work that staff has done in terms of identifying some specific conditions that be it Hyperblock, be it uh, Forge X out uh, at uh, Smurf at Stone or anyone else who wants to establish a business here uh, can operate cryptocurrency mining. You just got to invest in additional um, renewable energy. Because short of that, I, folks, we are just arranging the deck chairs on a sinking ship if we're saying that we're going to uh, uh, simply utilize existing supplies of renewable energy. We've got to build more renewables, uh, renewable electricity, if we're truly to uh, move the needle on addressing uh, climate change. It's not business as usual that we're uh, faced with today. Uh, the reality is, uh, at least as as near as I can tell, cryptocurrency mining is using exponentially more energy than any other uh, energy user. Um, as far as an industry goes, it's a grotesque amount of energy, and we've got to take steps to address it. <clears throat> it's kind of what I get for having Dave go first. I don't have anything left to say. But, uh, I do also want to echo my thanks to staff for doing such hard work and uh, really putting in the time to bring us detail, and to all of you people to coming out in the middle of the day to speak on, uh, on your own behalf. Uh, thanks for all that. Um, I want to note that things have changed in our landscape since uh, 2016, with the growth policy that said we, we have to account for climate change, and the momentous things that happened yesterday, where we promised that we're going to be developing all of our energy renewably by 2030. It forces us to do these hard things. I also want to reiterate, again, I'm just repeating everything Dave said, that this is interim zoning, and I am really sympathetic and super impressed with you guys. You were visionary and did great work. This buys us a year, and let's work together and come up with a way to do it. Thanks. 
And I'm, I'm even in worse position because now you, you said the few things I was going to say. Um, you know, but someone said this is complicated and we need more time. It is complicated and we do need more time. And that's what interim zoning affords us. And that's why we're doing it. And well, that's why we're taking this path. Um, I also heard acknowledgement um, that, that this is a, gro uh, is a global pr crisis, but it's not an emergency. And I, I find that interesting. I mean, if it's a global crisis, then it's a crisis locally, and it is an emergency that we do something about it. Um, and th with our authority, um, we can adopt interim zoning as an emergency measure in order to protect public health, safety, morals, and general welfare in our jurisdictional area. And the morals thing, I mean, you could talk all day about the values that our community holds and how this excessive use of energy for really no gain to the community um, goes against the values of this community in a very strong way and goes against multiple steps that the county has taken, that the city has taken, that Climate Smart Missoula has taken, that this community has taken to show really collectively how we feel about this issue. And the expectation is that we do do something about this. And this community agrees that we need to do something about this. And this is important on a value and a moral level. And so, and, and I agree, the reason we didn't go with a moratorium and why we've took a long time to get here is because it's hard to wrap your mind around that. And it's, it's, it's really easy to say a fire is an emergency, a flood is an emergency. But when we're really talking about a global crisis and the local impact impacts of that, it takes a lot of, of time and thought to get there. And I feel like we, we have done that. Um, we are not targeting one business. I can see why people think we are. Um, but we have seen one business and the impacts of it. And we want to prevent those impacts from happening on a larger scale and somewhere else in the county. I think there is absolute consensus that Bonner Development and Hyperblock have been wonderful because you spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to mitigate the noise that was destroying a community. People were having mental health issues, physical health issues caused by the noise of the facility and you guys stepped up and made great changes to it and everyone is happy with that. But what if that happens somewhere else and somebody doesn't care? And we can't do anything about it. You know, we had a whole series of public meetings about the noise issue as well. What if it was someone else and they said, we don't care, we're not gonna do anything about it. Well, the county couldn't have done anything to force you to do that, and you know that. And you're wonderful people, so you did something on your own. But we can't count on the goodness of people's hearts to mitigate issues for public health. That's our job, and that's our duty. And that's why we want to move forward in the next year of researching and figuring out what the best way to do that is. Um, economic development, it was brought up that our growth policy, we shouldn't, it did talk about climate change, but it t talks more about economic development was a comment that was made. Um, it does talk about economic development and we care deeply about economic development. As I mentioned in the last hearing, uh, cryptocurrency mining does not meet my definition of economic development. And furthermore, our growth policy does say that economic measures should focus on long-term economic development that is fiscally responsible and does not unduly compromise quality of life or the natural environment. And again, this industry does not comply with the, the economic development goals of our growth policy. Um, and so I am in agreement with my colleagues that I think this is a step that the county has a duty to take uh, to do our due diligence and figure out a long-term solution for this. And there, let's be clear, there are other cryptocurrency mining operations in the state of Montana that are getting their power from coal strip. and. Today's action, again, that we are contemplating is to get ahead of the curve on this because, uh, and I would agree with my colleague, uh, this is not, and contrary to what some might think, this is not about all about hyperblock. This is about charting a course for energy conservation and addressing climate change in Missoula County. Uh, for future generations. So it's not just about one business, although it absolutely uh, has impacts upon existing operations. I also just wanted to add that I had a conversation with the CEO of Energy Keepers here a couple weeks ago. And one of the questions I posed was, if Hyperblock was not purchasing power from your dam, would that just be 
water being spilled over the dam and energy not being generated and the, the answer he gave me was no there are buyers for the power uh, so it's it's not as though this is uh, renewable energy that otherwise is just being wasted um, so I think I will leave it at that and I'll go ahead and make the motion. Uh, I would move that uh, the zoning overlay regulation shown in attachment two in the commissioner's packet pertaining to cryptocurrency mining be approved and adopted as countywide interim zoning effective immediately for a period of one year. I'll second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We really appreciate your time. Uh, is there any other business to come before the commission? Uh, with that, we will adjourn. <laughs>